Welcome to Washington Today on C-SPAN Radio for Wednesday, August 7, 2024. Presidential campaigns moved to two more battleground states, Wisconsin and Michigan, with both the Democratic ticket, Vice President Kamala Harris, and running mate, Minnesota Governor Tim Walz, and Republican vice presidential nominee, Senator J.D. Vance of Ohio, holding rallies and news conferences. Democratic Congresswoman Cori Bush of Missouri, a member of the progressive group of House members known as the Squad, loses her Democratic primary to an opponent who received support from a super PAC aligned with the American Israel Public Affairs Committee and says in her concession speech, APAC, I'm coming to tear your kingdom down. It's day two of the National Transportation Safety Board hearing on the Boeing 737 MAX 9 in-flight door plug blowout from earlier this year. We'll speak with Reuters correspondent David Shepardson about what was learned, about who is to blame and what went wrong and how to keep it from happening again. Biden administration says it's still working through diplomacy to convince Iran not to respond militarily against Israel to the assassination of Hamas's political leader in Tehran last week. Russia says Ukrainian military forces have launched a cross-border assault into Russian territory, and there are questions to the White House whether this violates U.S. restrictions on use of American weapons. Two noted deaths, Republican political strategist Richard Galen and former Major League Baseball player Billy Bean, one of the few in the Major Leagues that came out as gay, will hear both of them from C-SPAN's video library. Article from Associated Press mid-afternoon, Eau Claire, Wisconsin, specifically Chippewa Valley Regional Airport is the center of the political universe at the moment. Vice President Kamala Harris and Republican vice presidential nominee J.D. Vance both landed and were on the tarmac outside the northwestern Wisconsin city, planning to hold separate campaign events scheduled for the same time in the afternoon. Harris, who arrived on Air Force Two, disembarked and left for her event, where she was to speak with her running mate, Minnesota Governor Tim Walz. Vance's aircraft could be seen taxiing as he prepared for his rally. Before leaving for his event, Vance walked over to get a closer look at Air Force Two, the aircraft he hopes to consider his main form of travel beginning in January. Wisconsin is among the handful of states considered the most competitive, where Democratic President Joe Biden won by fewer than 21,000 votes in 2020. That was from Associated Press. Senator Vance went to the airline equipment manufacturer NMC Woolard and talked about energy development in the U.S. He also took reporters' questions, including why he is following the Democratic presidential ticket around. W.W. Eau Claire. Uh, as you know, Kamala Harris is also speaking in Eau Claire yeah. right now with their new running mate Tim Walls. Why did you choose to speak here in Eau Claire today at the same time as Harris? Well, we wanted to make sure there was a contrast, in part because the media has been so dishonest about Kamala Harris's record, and in part because they refused to ask her questions. We wanted to make sure that there was at least somebody out there providing an alternative story. We have to remember, President Trump delivered a closed border and rising wages. What has Kamala Harris delivered? A promise to defund the police, a promise to ban fracking, and offshore drilling, a promise to destroy the American energy sector, a promise to increase the the prices of the goods that the American people rely on. She has not been a good vice president for the American people, and I don't think she deserves a, a, a promotion. I think she deserves to be fired, and that's what we're here talking to people about because the media needs to tell the other side of the story. And unfortunately, I think unless you have somebody here, they're not going to do that. Ma'am? Um, we've heard a lot from Democrats using the word weird, calling you weird, calling former President Trump weird. What do you make of that weird argument? I think that the weird argument honestly came from a bunch of 24-year-old social media interns who were bullied in school, and they decided they're going to project that onto the entire Trump campaign. And the reason it doesn't make sense is because you ask who's weird, right? Is I think it's pretty weird to be the border czar and to open up the border and allow fentanyl to come into your community. I think it's pretty weird to try to take children away from their parents if the parents don't want to consent to sex changes. That's something that Tim Waltz did. I think it's pretty weird to want to defund the police. I think it's pretty weird to pretend that you're a tough on crime prosecutor, even though you pursued the policies that made San Francisco such a disaster when it comes to crime and public safety. So if they want to call me weird, look, I've got my wife here. I've got three beautiful kids at home. I'm a normal guy who wants to live the American dream and wants all of you and your kids to be able to live the American dream. That's why I'm in it. If those people want to call me weird, I think it's a badge of honor. Senator J.D. Vance, Republican from Ohio, vice presidential nominee for the Republican Party, taking reporters' questions at a manufacturing plant in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. We will get to the Democratic presidential and vice presidential nominees in Eau Claire in just a couple of minutes on Washington Today. But earlier 
in the day. Senator Vance was in Detroit, Michigan, at a police station in Shelby Township, a Detroit suburb. Vice President Harris and Governor Walz are holding a rally in Detroit tonight. A reporter asked Senator Vance in Detroit about Governor Tim Walz, what he said about him yesterday. CBS Detroit. Last night, Governor Walt suggested that because of your Ivy League education and your Silicon backing your political career, that you yourself are part of the elite. What are your first impressions of them trying to frame you this way to the American public? Well, look, I came from a family where nobody in my family had ever gone to law school. I was... I grew up in a poor family. The fact that Tim Waltz wants to turn it into a bad thing, that I actually worked myself through college, through law school, and made something myself, to me, that's the American dream. And if Tim Waltz wants to insult it, I think that's frankly pretty bizarre. Now, look, what what, what really bothers me about Tim Waltz, it's not even the positions that he's taken, though certainly he has been a far-left radical. You know what really bothers me about Tim Waltz as a Marine who served his country in uniform? When the United States Marine Corps, when the United States of America asked me to go to Iraq to serve my country, I did it. I did what they asked me to do, it, and I did it honorably, and I'm very proud of that service. When Tim Waltz was asked by his country to go to Iraq, you know what he did? He dropped out of the Army and allowed his unit to go without him, a fact that he's been criticized for aggressively by a lot of the people that he served with. I think it's shameful to prepare your unit to go to Iraq, to make a promise that you're going to follow through, and then to drop out right before you actually have to go. I also think it's dishonest. Something, again, if you guys ever get an opportunity to ask Tim Waltz or Kamala Harris some questions, he made this interesting comment that the Kamala Harris campaign put out there, and I bet they're regretting they put it out there now, because he said that we, and he was making a point about gun control, he said we shouldn't allow weapons that I used in war to be on America's streets. Well, I wonder, Tim Waltz, when were you ever in war? When was this, what was this weapon that you carried into war given that you abandoned your unit right before they went to Iraq and he has not spent a day in a combat zone? What bothers me about Tim Waltz is the stolen valor garbage. Do not pretend to be something that you're not. And if he wants to criticize me for getting an Ivy League education, I'm proud of the fact that my mamaw supported me, that I was able to make something of myself. I'd be ashamed if I was him and I lied about my military service like he did. Senator J.D. Vance, Republican from Ohio, the Republican vice presidential nominee, taking reporters' questions in Michigan. Governor Walz ended his military career in 2005 as he began a run successfully for a U.S. House seat. The Daily Wire has more about this accusation that you just heard. It reads, when Walz was running for governor in 2018, former members of the National Guard spoke out about his service with a retired command sergeant major saying he embellished and selectively omitted facts of his military career for years. In an open letter posted on Facebook that year, retired Command Sergeants Major Thomas Behrens and Paul Herr wrote that Walls retired just a few months after receiving a warning order that his battalion would be deployed to Iraq, even though he told military personnel he would be going on the mission. That was from the Daily Wire. Former President Donald Trump, the Republican presidential nominee this year, said today on Fox News that he could not be more thrilled that Vice President Kamala Harris chose Minnesota Governor Tim Walz to be her running mate. If you look at his record with no walls, no security, let everybody in, he's worse than they are. You know, nobody knew how radical left she was, but he's a smarter version of her. If you want to know the truth, he's probably about the same uh, as Bernie Sanders. He's probably more so than Bernie Sanders. She is more so than Bernie Sanders. That's got to be your guide, Bernie Sanders. And it's not a great guide. But uh, this is there's never been a ticket like this. This is a ticket that would want this country go, to go communist immediately, if not sooner. Uh, we want no security. Mm-hmm. We want no anything. He's very heavy into transgender. Anything transgender he thinks is great. And uh, he's not where the country is on anything. Mr. President, you... uh, this is a shocking limit. This is a shocking pick. And I think it's very insulting to Jewish people. And I think it's very insulting to people that want security. I think it's very insulting to anything having to do with making America great again. Former President Donald Trump, the Republican presidential nominee, part of his interview this morning on Fox News. Vice President Kamala Harris, the Democratic presidential nominee, and Governor Tim Walz, the Vice presidential nominee of the Democratic Party held a rally today in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Governor Walz went first. The question is pretty simple. This election is all about asking that question. Which direction will this country go in? 
Donald Trump knows the direction he wants to take us. He wants to take it back. He wants to do the things that you saw. But be very clear. Don't believe him when he plays dumb. He knows exactly what he's talking about. He knows exactly what Project 2025 will do in restricting and taking our freedoms. He knows that it rigs the economy for the super rich. If he gets a chance to go back to the White House, it will be far worse than it was four years ago. Raising costs for the middle class, repeating, repealing the Affordable Care Act, gutting Social Security and Medicare, the very safety nets that protect people when they're down. And of course, banning abortions across this country with or without Congress. This is where we talk to our neighbors. Donald Trump is not for you or your family. And Trump's running mate shares those same dangerous and backward beliefs. You know, just like all of us in regular America, we, uh, we go to Yale and then we have our careers funded by Silicon Valley billionaires. And then you write a book about the place you grew up and you trash that place. Come on, that's not who Wisconsin is. That's not who Minnesota is. We're better than that. We're better than that. One of the best parts of this job is going to be, I can't wait till the debate. <laughs> so. Look, I, I've done this enough, and I know bullies, uh, and I'm not a name caller, but what I am as a teacher, I observe things. So I want to tell you, what I observed and you've deserved about, you observed about these guys when you see them, that it's a very clear thing. Yes, they are creepy and, and weird as hell. You see it. You see it. This is not normal. This is not normal behavior. Nobody's asking for this crazy stuff. Minnesota Governor Tim Walz, Democratic vice presidential nominee at a rally today in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. NPR News says it was an estimated crowd of about 10,000. And after he spoke, it was time for the presidential nominee of the Democratic Party, Vice President Kamala Harris. So listen, let me tell you, I am clear. The path to the White House runs right through this state. And with your help... We will win in November. We are going to win. We are going to win. And I've been here many times, as you all know, recently and even before. And many of you know then, before I was elected vice president, before I was elected United States senator, I was an elected attorney general, and before that, an elected district attorney. And before that, and before that, I was a courtroom prosecutor. So in those roles, I took on perpetrators of all kinds. Predators who abused women, fraudsters who ripped off consumers, scammers who broke the rules for personal gain, So hear me when I say, I know Donald Trump's tight. I know his tight. In fact, I've been dealing with people like him my whole career. For example, as Attorney General of California, well, hold on, you know what? The courts are going to handle that part of it. What we're going to do is beat him in November. (laughs) So I'll tell you, as Attorney General, I took on one of our country's largest for-profit colleges that scammed students. Well, Donald Trump ran a for-profit college that scammed students. As a prosecutor, I specialized in cases of sexual abuse. Well... Donald Trump was found liable for committing sexual abuse. As Attorney General, I held the big Wall Street banks accountable for fraud. Well, Donald Trump was just found guilty of fraud. 34 counts. 
So in this campaign, I'll tell you, I will proudly put my record against his any day of the week. Any day of the week. But let's make no mistake. This campaign is not just about us versus Donald Trump. It's about two very different visions for our nation. Two very different visions. One, for us, focused on the future. The other, focused on the past. And Wisconsin, we, we here, we fight for the future. Vice President Kamala Harris, Democratic presidential nominee in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, part of a tour of battleground states that she and her newly named vice presidential running mate on the Democratic ticket, Governor Tim Walz of Minnesota, are making and following them around was, is the Republican vice presidential nominee, Senator J.D. Vance of Ohio. An article from The Guardian among recent national head-to-head polls, Survey USA put Harris up three points ahead of Trump, 48 percent to 45 percent. Morning Consult put her up four points, 48 percent to 44 percent. YouGov and CBS made it a one point Harris lead, 50 to 49. And University of Massachusetts Amherst put Harris up three, 46 to 43. Those results were mostly within the margin of error that from The Guardian. Congresswoman Cori Bush of Missouri writes roll call. On Tuesday, became the second member of the progressive squad to lose her seat in the House over a bitter Democratic primary with St. Louis County prosecuting attorney Wesley Bell that drew $15.6 million in outside spending. Bell had 51 percent of the vote to Bush's 46 percent when the Associated Press called the race late Tuesday night. The results are another setback for the Democratic Party's progressive wing following New York Congressman Jamal Bowman's loss in June to Westchester County Executive George Latimer, a moderate with deep local ties. The primary in the dark blue district centered on St. Louis was largely shaped by the split over Israel. Bell received heavy support from pro-Israel groups, while Bush has been one of the most prominent critics of Israel in Congress. That was from Roll Call. Here's Congresswoman Bush Tuesday night speaking to her supporters after her defeat. There is nothing that happens in my life that happens in vain. So if this happened, it's because it was meant to happen. And let me say, it's because of the work that I need to do. And let me say this. to tear your kingdom down. And let me put all of these corporations on notice. Congresswoman Cori Bush, Democrat from Missouri, Tuesday night at her election night watch party in St. Louis after she lost the Democratic primary in the first congressional district to St. Louis County prosecuting attorney Wesley Bell, 51 percent to 46 percent. Wesley Bell spoke at his own victory party. We were coming out of the Galleria because we had lunch at at Cheesecake Factory. (laughs) And this little girl 
who couldn't have been more than five or six years old, a little bitty girl, she saw me and her jaw just dropped. Wow. And I'm telling y'all, that, that hit me differently. Like, it made me realize that this isn't just about campaigning and adults talking and, and negative messaging, but our kids are watching. Yes, they are. And what we say matters. What we post on Twitter and on Facebook, our kids are watching. So if we truly care about paving a way and preparing our next generation, we have to start paying attention to the political discourse. We have to start paying attention to what we say and not only what we say, but how we say it. And so I can tell you that moment, that moment, and I said it to folks on my staff, that moment, I was so happy that not yes. one, ne one word out of my mouth was negative, defaming in any way, not yes. one single word out of my mouth. I am absolutely honored and humbled to be the Democratic nominee for Congress in this district. Wesley Bell, Tuesday night after his Democratic primary victory over incumbent Cory Bush in Missouri's first congressional district. Associated Press writes that Bell is heavily favored to carry this overwhelmingly Democratic district in November when his party is aiming to retake control of the U.S. House. And results from a seat in Washington state, the 4th Congressional District incumbent Dan Newhouse, a Republican facing challenges because he is one of the two remaining House Republicans who voted to impeach former President Donald Trump. And the results there that Jared Sessler, a Republican, got 30 percent in the open primary. Newhouse got 25 percent. They were the two top vote getters. And so both of them will be on the ballot for the November general election. From Reuters, the head of the National Transportation Safety Board said on Wednesday the Alaska Airlines Boeing 737 MAX 9 mid-air emergency was entirely avoidable because the plane makers should have addressed unauthorized production work long ago. NTSB Chair Jennifer Homedy told reporters on the second day of the hearing into the January 5th incident this accident should never have happened. In a moment, we'll talk with a reporter on that article, David Shepardson, about the in-flight door plug blowout incident. First, here are some of today's hearing. A representative of the Association of Flight Attendants Union questioning Paul Wright, Senior Director of Boeing's Safety Management Systems. This question is also for you. During uh, panel two yesterday, Ms. Lund had said that uh, we talk a lot about not sacrificing safety for operational pressure. And AFA members know from experience that safety talk by itself is not effective safety promotion. It was also noted during panel two yesterday that safety talk isn't doing much for Boeing's employees either, at least from some of the interviews. And I'm thinking of the comment about the safety posters, basically their safety promotion that they're aware of. What meaningful action is Boeing taking to demonstrate that it really is okay to slow down or stop the operation for safety? And we're preferring, of course, to pillar four here. Sure. I'm a, a firm believer that leadership actions have to match the work we ask people to do, have to match the work environment they're doing it in. If those don't match, there is no promotion. And I, I think uh, an example that I'm finding very powerful right now is the traveled work safety risk assessment process that we've implemented on 737, flow days one through seven, and uh, 787 in the first two uh, positions. <clears throat> the change I'm seeing, because I get the, I'm part of the daily oversight, is we are holding the airplane on a much more regular basis, and we're seeing rework numbers go down. So I uh, see um, fairly significant percentages of airplanes held if the safety risk assessment says we cannot do that work and keep either people safe or the airplane safe. Paul Wright, Senior Director of Boeing Safety Management Systems at the National Transportation Safety Board hearing.
David Shepardson, Reuters correspondent, has been covering the NTSB hearing on the Boeing 737 MAX 9 mid-air door plug blowout from earlier this year. He joins us now. Thanks for being with us. NTSB already did an investigation and identified the technical reasons for the accident. So what is this hearing trying to answer? So the NTSB is spending at least 20 hours over two days questioning people at the FAA, Spirit Aero Systems, which is the company that built the fuselage for the 737 MAX, and Boeing to determine you know, so what, what went wrong in the production of the plane that experienced this mid-air blowout. Because you know, we know principally what went wrong, which is that this airplane during production, this part, a door plug, which is basically an unused emergency exit, was taken out on the line and put back in. But the paperwork was not created to document this incident, or this this, um, removal. And what we know from the NTSB is that that plug was missing four key bolts that allowed it to to blow out during that flight in January. So so this painstaking two days of hearings is really to get at a number of issues surrounding the removal. You know, one, what were the quality and safety management problems of both Spirit and Boeing before this incident? You know, why didn't Boeing do a better job of of preventing unauthorized work and work that was not documented from being done? And why did the Federal Aviation Administration not do a better job of overseeing Boeing? Senator Cantwell, Marie Cantwell, the chair of the Senate Commerce Committee, said last week that the FAA and the, the two years before that incident had conducted you know, upwards of 300 audits of Spirit and Boeing, but had done, you know, had, had found little and had not really taken a hard enough line ensuring that Boeing and Spirit, you know, were consistently building quality airplanes. So these hearings are really about trying to get to that question of why did it take this incident uh, to, to lead to these reforms both at Boeing and Spirit, as well as the FAA, which has now taken a much a much harder line toward Boeing. We're talking on day two of two, that, and it's been going on uh, for, for a bit. So do you think they'll reach a conclusion, or is there just some finger-pointing going on? No, I, I, think, I think when the board finally you know, issues its probable cause findings, which are probably going to happen you know, sometime in early to next year, I do think, you know, we'll have a pretty clear understanding, and I, and I think you'll see the board make a, a number of safety recommendations. I think the question is going to be, you know, with the, the new FAA posture, right, which is more, which is, you know, many more inspectors on the factory floor, audits that are more hands-on versus just simply reviewing paperwork from people at Boeing to ensure that, that these planes are being done. You know, I think that the long-term question for everybody, Boeing, Spirit, the FAA, Congress, is is the system in place to ensure that these planes are properly inspected? Remember, an airplane is about 500,000 parts. I mean, these are incredibly complex machines, and obviously the FAA cannot inspect every part uh, as, after these planes get assembled. The question is, do they? does Boeing have and Spirit have enough robust processes to ensure that something as important as a door plug removal, you know, can't happen without being documented, right? How do you, how do you ensure that this type of thing doesn't happen again? You know, Boeing did say yesterday they're going to redesign that specific part to make it impossible, you know, to put back in and then close without, without it being, um, you know, without those bolts being, being tightened. But, but sort of beyond that, that specific part, the question remains, how can they ensure that they have a, a, a system in place that won't let these types of human errors slip through. We're talking with Reuters correspondent David Shepardson. In terms of the structure of the hearing, it's not just the NTSB board members who are asking the questions. Who else is there, and why was it set up that way? Yeah, it's really interesting, right? So it's technically called a board of inquiry, right? And the parties to the investigation, right, Alaska, the union representing the mechanics at Boeing, IAM, uh, the FAA, the other parties to the investigation spirit, 
the other parties are allowed to ask questions with one glaring exception, Boeing. So back in June, a Boeing executive who actually testified yesterday almost all day ran afoul of the of the board's party rules. Once you become a party to a an NTSB investigation, you're not allowed to disclose any informa- any information that without the without the board's approval you know, during the investigation. And the board said that Boeing had violated those rules uh, on potentially two different occasions, and they t- took the very serious step of barring Boeing from getting any information that's not public for the rest of the, uh, of the investigation and barred Boeing from asking questions at this hearing. So everybody else is allowed to ask questions during these very long rounds with the exception of Boeing. So it's been a really rough few months for Boeing. Obviously, they've endured months of bad publicity and ridicule over this incident. You know, they have agreed to plead guilty uh, after the Justice Department charged them with a felony for violating their deferred prosecution agreement, stemming from the first two the, the fatal max crashes in 2018 and 2019, uh, and and then this. And so, you know, the company, which is getting a new CEO starting tomorrow, really is trying to to right the ship and remember still needs to get the FAA's approval to build more air max airplanes right the FAA took the unprecedented step in January of telling Boeing until we're confident that you can build safe airplanes you may not build more than 38 planes per month and the FAA has said we're not going to restore that uh, ability to build more airplanes until until we're confident that this quality plan that they proposed is in place and, and they can do it safely. David Shepardson, a Reuters correspondent, joining us from outside the hearing room during a break in the two-day NTSB hearing on the Boeing MAX 737-9 door plug in-flight blowout. You can find his work at Reuters.com and on X at David Shepardson. Thank you very much. Hey, really appreciate it. On Wall Street today, the Dow down 234, NASDAQ down 171, S&P down 40. The article at CNBC, stocks close lower on Wednesday as the market's attempt to fully recover from Monday's sell-off failed. Washington today continues in a moment. We need your help to reach our $25,000 summer fundraising goal. A generous donor will match every dollar you give, doubling your impact. I'm Paul at C-SPAN, and your support keeps the unfiltered access you rely on, allowing you to think for yourself. Donate now at cspan.org slash donate and make twice the difference. Every amount helps. Thank you for your support. Double your donation at cspan.org slash donate. Welcome back to Washington Today, available as a podcast wherever you find your podcasts and on the free C-SPAN Now mobile app. From the Jerusalem Post, the wait for Iran's retaliatory response to the assassination of Ismail Haniyeh attributed to Israel is taking longer than the United States initially anticipated. Sources familiar with American intelligence told the Saudi state-owned Al Arabiya. U.S. officials, such as Secretary of State Antony Blinken, warned on Sunday and Monday that the strike would occur within 24 hours. But as of now, neither Iran nor Hezbollah has taken any action. While the exact nature of the response remains unclear, American officials noted they are confident it is imminent. According to the Al Arabiya report, the latest intelligence suggests the response may be delayed until Thursday or Friday. That was from Jerusalem Post. The U.S. State Department spokesperson Matthew Miller took reporters' questions about this at his news conference in Washington. I know uh, Admiral Kirby spoke a little bit about the the current state of play, but but wondering in particular um, uh, with the situation between Iran and Israel, where things stand now, has there been any further communication from the secretary or others with with players in the region? Uh, How how worried are you right now about the chance of uh, of escalation? Um, So we continue to engage in very intense diplomacy with uh, allies and partners in the region to make clear that we don't believe anyone should escalate this conflict. Um, As you know, the secretary has been engaged in calls really since last week. I don't have any new ones to read out today, but it's been an ongoing process, and I expect to engage in further conversations in the days ahead. And the message that we are sending to everyone is, look, this is obviously a very delicate time for the region. Tensions are high. We are in the final stages, hopefully, of a ceasefire deal. And 
escalation has the potential to make every problem the region faces worse. And so the message that we are impressing upon everyone in the region is that no party should take any steps to escalate this conflict. Uh, a couple of things on that. Um, could you talk about the OIC meeting and how significant or not it would be? Uh, obviously, Iran and, and, and the Palestinians uh, called this. Um, what message do you, I, mean, I know the U.S. Isn't a, isn't a member, but what message do you hope this sends uh, to Iran? So uh, we would hope that at that OIC meeting, the same thing happens that we have been, hope that we have been trying to effectuate throughout the last week, which is that all parties that have a relationship with Iran impress upon Iran, the same way that we've been impressing upon the government of Israel, um, that they shouldn't take any steps to escalate the conflict. And so obviously there are a number of countries with whom we speak who are attending that meeting, who are members of the OIC. Um, we have heard from those countries really a broad consensus in every conversation that we have had that they share our opinion that escalation would only exacerbate the problems facing the region. And so certainly we would hope that countries at, at, at that meeting would impress that upon Iran. State Department spokesperson Matthew Miller at his news conference at the State Department in Washington. A story from Al Jazeera. The Organization of Islamic Cooperation, OIC, has blamed Israel for the attack that killed Hamas political chief Ismail Haniya last week in Iran, which has vowed to retaliate, a statement issued after an extraordinary meeting of the 57-member bloc on Wednesday in Saudi Arabia, said it holds Israel, the illegal occupying power, fully responsible for this heinous attack, which it described as a serious infringement of Iran's sovereignty. That article from Al Jazeera. From the Washington Post, Russian President Vladimir Putin confirmed Wednesday that Ukrainian forces had crossed the border into the Kurts region of western Russia and carried out an attack describing the operation as a large-scale provocation. Putin told members of the Russian government at a meeting the Kyiv regime has launched another major provocation, claiming Ukraine was firing indiscriminately using various types of weapons, including rockets at civilian buildings, residential houses, ambulances. Russia's defense ministry said Russian forces had repelled the attack and Kiev so far has not acknowledged the attack and Ukraine's defense ministry and intelligence agencies declined to comment. That reporting from Washington Post. There were questions about this at today's White House briefing with the press secretary, Corinne Jean-Pierre. What's the president's thinking about the um, uh, bordering uh, incursion that Ukraine is currently making into Russia? Has he got any concerns that that could sort of make so look, I can say I can say this is that we are going to obviously we've seen the reportings uh, obviously uh, so we're going to reach out uh, uh, to uh, to um, uh, to the Ukrainian military to learn more about their objectives. Uh, we, as far as the specifics on that, I would refer you to the Ukrainian, uh, the Ukrainians to speak about their own military operations. That's where uh, I would I would uh, refer you to. Uh, but we are, generally speaking, as you know, we have been supported of Ukraine uh, as they are as they are uh, defending themselves against uh, Russia's aggression. We think that is obviously important to do as we talk about democracy and freedom. And so we're going to continue to do that. Uh, and they are going to take actions, right? Common sense actions to. Uh, certainly t uh, to protect themselves from these attacks. Uh, but as for the specific uh, operation, we're going to reach out to them to see what their objective is and continue to stay focused. We are going to continue to stay focused on making sure they have what they need to defend themselves against Russia's aggression. Okay. Uh, thank you, Corinne. You mentioned that you've seen the reports. I'm curious, I mean, was the White House made aware prior to? No. Is there any uh, uh, any feeling that if there is evidence of, of U.S. supplied weapons or munitions being used in this uh, this attack, could it lead to further escalation? I'm just not going to get into hypotheticals. Let us do our outreach uh, to the Ukraine Ukrainian military. I just don't have anything beyond that. We have to remember that. Uh, uh, obviously, in this region, uh, that uh, there's r Russian troops there. Uh, they are in a region of Russia, and they're in that region attacking Ukraine. And so we can't forget that. Uh, but uh, our policies, has, House policy, has, has not changed. Uh, we're going to continue, certainly, to support Ukraine as they continue to defend themselves. The White House Press Secretary, Corrine Jean-Pierre, at her news conference at the White House. John Kirby, the White House National Security Communications Advisor, earlier at a separate briefing, said the U.S. had not changed its policy of allowing Ukraine to use American-supplied weapons, quote, to target imminent threats just across the border. Reed Galen writes on X, My dad, Rich Galen, passed away yesterday. He was a fixture in Washington for decades. He loved politics, but he loved America most. 
Thanks to so many of you for the kind words. And Reed Galen attached an article that began, In memoriam, Rich Galen, a longtime Republican consultant and writer, has died. His son Reed writes in. He was 77. During a 40-year career in Washington, he worked on Capitol Hill at the National Republican Congressional Committee and for the likes of Senator Dan Quayle and Speaker of the House Newt Gingrich and too many other campaigns and projects to count. Galen did extensive work with the International Republican Institute, including helping Eastern Bloc countries develop political parties after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Well, Rich Galen was on C-SPAN several times over the years. One of the earliest, 1986, he spoke to American University students about political campaign opposition research. Opposition research is anything that there is to know about your opponent. You, you will have heard or you will hear about the difference between strategy and tactics. Opposition, the, the decision to do opposition research, i.e. to find out all there is to find out about your opponent, is a strategic decision. The tactical part of it comes in deciding what and when to use whatever it is you have found. But in this day and age, with the enormous amount of information that's available about everybody, uh, if, if you in a campaign do not do proper opposition research, then you probably deserve to lose. And, and, and every, in all uh, probability, it will not help your campaign. Um, what, what are the kinds of things that are involved? Okay, The first thing you, you want to think about is this, this is not terribly exciting to do the whole matter of op- opposition research. is a lot of legwork, a lot of digging, a lot of, a lot of really kind of boring looking in public records and what have you to find out the information that you think might be of interest. It's not necessarily finding out only bad things about your opponent. It's also finding out good things about your opponent so you know what his strengths are. And that's something that we often, almost always, forget about in opposition research. We want to see what his strengths are. Think of it in terms of watching game films of a football team. If you have a football team, the chance no, no football team from the high school level on up will go into a game without having first reviewed the films of its opponent so that it, find out, it finds out what the other team's tendencies are it's so that you have some feel for if you have them uh, third and long, you know, in the middle of the field, what they're likely to do, that sort of thing. Same thing with this kind of opposition research and like watching game films, for, the, for those of you who have done it or seen seen other people doing or talked about it. It's unbelievably boring. You go over it again and again and again and again and again. And like the real honest to goodness game, sometimes you guess wrong. You think that they're going to do something in a certain situation, so you set up a defense for it, and lo and behold, they cross you up. And when you were blitzing, you had one-on-one coverage out there, and they throw it for a touchdown. And that can also happen in this whole matter of opposition research. Rich Galen, Republican political consultant, back in 1986, speaking at an American University discussion on political campaign opposition research. That from C-SPAN's video library at cspan.org. Rich Galen has passed away at the age of 77. Democratic consultant and strategist Donna Brazil posting on X that Rich Galen was a good, honorable, and decent man. Rich was more than a political strategist. He was authentically American. My sincere condolences to his beloved family and devoted friends. Rich was my friend. May his memory be a blessing. May his soul rest in peace. Story from ESPN, Billy Bean, who in 1999 became the second former Major League Baseball player to come out as gay and later became the sport's senior vice president for diversity, equity, and inclusion, has died. He was 60. MLB released a statement confirming his death. The California native played in six big league seasons from 1987 to 95, making his debut with the Detroit Tigers in a four-hit performance that tied a record for a player in his first game. He also played for the Los Angeles Dodgers and San Diego Padres. He was a two-time All-American outfielder at Loyola Marymount, leading the team to the Men's College World Series in 1986. That was reporting from ESPN. In 2003, Billy Bean was on C-SPAN 2's Book TV at the Miami Book Fair on his new book, Going the Other Way, Lessons from a Life in and Out of Major League Baseball. And he talked about why he decided after retiring from baseball to reveal that he was gay and to write the book. Had I seen an image of Billy Bean when I was 17 or 18 or 21, there would probably have been a lot of decisions that I made in my life that I would not have made. And, and the idea that I think all of us need to see images of ourselves, we learn the most from the people that interact with our lives each and every day, your next door neighbor, your children, your brothers and sisters, your coworkers, not the person you see on television that comes on at 8 o'clock on Thursday nights. Um, and I thought, 
maybe this is not about an invasion of my privacy. Maybe this is not about um, anything else except there's a time and place in life where all of us are asked to meet um, a responsibility. Maybe we have that responsibility forever. But for me, um, this book was sort of something that I, I feel like in my heart I was meant to do. Um, I don't know if I'll ever write another book. Um, the response to it has been overwhelming because I think, and only for this reason, is that I told the truth and I wrote it as, as a form of therapy and as a way to somehow relate to my, the, my experience to my parents. Because I wrote it before I had a publisher. <laughs> so there wasn't a, a financial motivation. There wasn't a need to tell more about myself. Um, in fact, many times, um, you know, I look at Ephraim and I think, you know, man, it just the idea of, of being private again, um, your privacy is an amazing thing. And you don't really realize it until it's not there. And then you respect what that means. But by and large, the experience um, has been one that I, I am so grateful that I was put in that position to do because I feel like, A, it's helped me let go of the fact that I walked away from a career and felt like because I'm gay that I don't belong in the major leagues after working 25 years to get there. Um, in the prime of my life, the height of my earning power, um, and B, the idea that I have been touched by so many, you know, this isn't Madeleine Albright's book, this isn't Hillary Clinton's book, this isn't a million readers, this is about people who are looking for something that they can relate to. And when parents come up to me and they say, if my son or daughter could have read this book, I think they would still be here today. From C-SPAN's video library at cspan.org, Billy Bean in 2003 on C-SPAN 2's Book TV at the Miami Book Fair, the title of his book, Going the Other Way, Lessons from a Life in and Out of Major League Baseball. Billy Bean went on to become Major League Baseball's Senior Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. He has died at the age of 60. An article at Outsports.com says that there have only been three Major League Baseball players to come out as gay and none while active players. Glenn Burke in 1982, Billy Bean in 1999, and T.J. House in 2022. Thanks for listening to Washington Today. Subscribe to C-SPAN's free evening newsletter, Word for Word. You'll get the stories making headlines in Washington sent to your inbox every day. Sign up at cspan.org slash connect. Have a good night. <laughs>